God, oh my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a human being. I am scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me feel secure on my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near. There is no one to help. From you comes the theme of my praise. In the great assembly, before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Good morning, Cross Point. How are you guys this morning? Good. Well, you guys ready to study the Bible? Yes. Awesome. Very good. Well, my name is Steve McKenzie, and I serve here as the executive pastor. Our lead pastor, Pastor Chan, was away last week. He was away on vacation, and then this week he's going to be attending a conference. So please be lifting them up in prayer during this time that they would be um, refreshed. And then this morning, we have the opportunity to continue in our series called Songs of the Savior. It's where we're looking at uh, 10 different psalms that are quoted in the book of Hebrews, which we're going to study in the fall, starting after Labor Day. And so we're walking through those this summer. And this morning, we're looking in particular at Psalm 22. So that was the reason why I wanted to change up the, the bumper video a little bit, this opening video, because to be quite honest, the, the passage this morning, it's a lament. It's morning, and that bumper video seems so out of place, (laughs) like with the happy-go-lucky feelings of like, yay, everything's great, and this passage is going to dive in and be like, I feel forsaken by God. I cry out, and he doesn't hear me. Like that has a different feeling and a different tone. And so I wanted to help draw our eyes to that this morning, and there's really three things that I want us to see this morning as we just walk through uh, the passage. And the first is that there's some parts of this passage that you're going to recognize from the Gospels, words that Jesus spoke while he was hanging on the cross. You're going to be like, oh, this is familiar. Like uh, Spurgeon calls this the song of the cross. And it's true that, that we're going to see a beautiful display of the gospel here in Psalm 22 that was written a thousand years before Jesus was ever crucified. And yet in understanding that, that this was written a thousand years before Jesus was crucified, that there was real pain. Like the psalmist David was experiencing something in the present when he wrote these words. God intended them for something greater as well, but they also echoed his own heart, his own brokenness. And I don't want us to miss that. I want us to to understand that and understand how that applies to our own lives. That maybe you're here this morning, and you're going through a a dark depression, maybe mourning, maybe grief, a a brokenness that nobody else around you knows about. This passage speaks to that, and there's a hope that that lives in the gospel that I pray that we feel, And, and the way that it ends is it's a song of praise, it's a song of hope that comes out from this story of brokenness. And so how do we move through that? How do we move from a a place of brokenness to a position of praise? Just this morning, actually right before I came out here, I got a a text message from someone that attends here who's been going through a a difficult time, and and it's just been one after another, and he wrote me, and he's like, my cousin passed away last night, and he was like my brother, like pray, like this is real. These emotions are real, and so I want to start by, by praying, and, and as we walk through this psalm, that God would meet you where you're at this morning, 
And then then point our eyes and our hearts to the hope that we have in the gospel, that even in the midst of pain, we can sing and celebrate and praise the name of Jesus. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you that your word brings to the surface areas that, to be honest, we don't often like to talk about. We would prefer to think that everything is is peaceful and great, and in reality, Lord, we we experience seasons of, of brokenness. We experience depression. We experience grief, Lord. We mourn that the world is broken. And Lord, I pray that that your word would help shepherd our hearts um, to know how to navigate those feelings, Lord, to see the beauty of Christ more clearly. Lord, when it feels like our prayers are falling on deaf ears, Lord, help our hearts to know the truth and help us to, to rest in that and sing the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name, amen. So let's jump in here to verses 1 and 2. We're just going to be walking right through this psalm. And the first part is really understanding that this is a, a song of brokenness. I mean, listen to, to David's prayer. We're in Psalm chapter 22. This is in verse 1. If you need the, the Bible in front of you, it's on page 260. There's also uh, notes on xpoint.info that you can kind of follow along with these points and some details if you want to take notes. But listen to the depth of these words. Like, don't let, if you're familiar with them, don't let them be so familiar that that you lose sight of the weight. Like, these words were on the psalmist's lips. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are, are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. If you heard somebody praying this, what would you think? You're in community group. They've just cried out that, God, you're so far from me, I don't even hear you. I cry cry all day, all night, but nothing, nothing. I mean, is it okay for a Christian to feel this way? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like, I hope so. Right? I mean, I, I kind of feel like that, that's the way we feel sometimes, because like, I kind of feel like the answer might be no, but I feel this way, so I hope it's yes. But sometimes we throw these spiritual things at people, right? Well, don't you know in, in Hebrews 13, which we're about to study, Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You're not forsaken. It's all good. And you're like, oh, thank you. It's like when you're sad and you're grieving, and someone says, oh, d- don't cry. Don't be sad. Oh, thank you. That helps, Right? No, I'm not sad anymore. That's what I need to hear. I just forgot I'm supposed to be happy. Life doesn't work that way, right? I mean, we can be honest with one another here. Like, the brokenness is real. And just throwing things at it does not always help. And and that's what we see here, that sometimes as as Christians in the West, uh, Pastor Miguel mentioned this a few weeks ago when he was preaching on one of the Psalms that is also a lament, that we don't always know how to mourn well, do we? We hide it as Christians. Oh, Christians are supposed to be happy. They're supposed to have it all together. But God forbid that I'm actually grieving something or mourning something or feeling a lament like God is distant. Certain emotions are, are, are taboo. I, I remember when I was five years old, I had had uh, ear infections really bad when I was younger. So when I was four, they put tubes in my ear. And then when I was five, they were going to be taking them out. And the idea was it was supposed to, I guess, open up the ear canal to prevent the ear infections, and then you start to grow out of them, and they can just pull those tubes out. So I'm five years old. We're sitting at the doctor's office, and we're getting ready to go in to get the tubes taken out. And my mom's like, now, be a big boy and don't cry. Now, don't judge her. She feels terrible about this now, okay? (laughs) Um, Please don't. And so we go in there, though, and he starts to tug, and it hurts, and it really hurt, but I'm going to be a big boy, and I'm not going to cry, and when the doctor pulled it out, it, it still had the skin attached when they pulled them out, and the doctor's like, why didn't you say anything? And my mom felt horrible, but I was like, I was told not to cry. Like, you don't cry. And Now, to, to my mom's credit, we've all been there. You have a five-year-old, 
they can act like you're amputating a limb. That's what she was saying. How I interpreted it was wrong. But, but sometimes in life's more serious struggles, it's more than just having the tubes pulled out of your ear, right? When a loved one passes away, when, when sickness strikes, we had a partner here who one day everything's fine. Next thing you know, he has cancer and that they're having to remove half his thumb and praying to God that it hasn't spread through the rest of his body. In a matter of days, this unfolds. That, that there's real struggle. A, a loved one walks out being treated uh, unjustly simply because of the color of your skin or your ethnic background? Like, the, the pain is real, and it's deep. But what do we do with this? Because a lot of times we like to distract ourselves, right? I mean, I've noticed it in myself by the way I parent. So I'm not judging anybody here. These are all things that I've done myself. When my kids are sad, it's kind of an inconvenience. Right? Right? And so you try to distract them. Oh, oh, you're sad? Here, here's my phone. Watch something on Netflix, right? Use this app. Oh, oh, you're sad about not getting this? Here's a cookie, you know? Enjoy this cookie. Everything will be better. Now it's mint chocolate chip ice cream and Oreo cookies. I still like my cookies, right? Or... or you know, if it's not eating, if it's not these other things, it can also be to buy something. I think of the lullabies I used to sing my kids as they were going to sleep. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Papa's going to buy you a mockingbird or then a diamond ring, and it keeps kind of going up, and you're like, wait a minute. I hope they don't remember any of these songs I'm singing, but sometimes we do what we soothe our emotions by buying stuff, right? By entertainment by food. We, we, we don't want to feel what we feel, so let, let me just binge on Netflix. I don't want to feel what I feel, so let me go buy something new so I feel good for a moment. And we live in this constant motion of distraction so we don't have to feel those emotions. But I love what, what Walter Brugman says in his book, Spirituality of the Psalms. He says, the Psalms are a boundary thrown up against this kind of self-deception. They do not permit us to ignore and deny the darkness, either personally or publicly, for that is where new life is given. That's exactly what this psalm is doing. It's bringing it to the surface. And it's saying these emotions are real. They're felt. At times we feel forsaken. At times we feel like God is silent. The mourning, the grief is legitimate. And that's okay. God meets us in that. And, and the pattern that I want us to see this morning is what unfolds here in the psalm. Because I realize some of you this morning, you're coming in and you're like, this is timely. Thank you. Because I'm going through a difficult season. Others are like, my day was going great. I was headed to the beach. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right? And the reality is, is maybe today's great. But one day, you're going to walk through that valley of darkness. And my prayer is that you remember these words and that they help you navigate that season when you do go through it. That, that, that celebrate that you're going through a, a good season right now. But remember the words. And for those who are struggling, I pray that you do feel encouragement from this. So look at how the psalmist continues in verses 3 through 5. So he's just said, I cry out by day and by night, but I find no rest yet. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and, and in you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were rescued, and in you they trusted and were not put to shame. You can see this inner dialogue happening with the psalmist. He's like, I'm, I'm in such despair, I'm crying out, God doesn't hear me. But, but they cried out. Others have cried out, and, and you heard them. You rescued them. And, and that can bring encouragement, right? Like how many people here, and I want you to show me by a raise of hands, have gone through a difficult season in your life, and God met you in that difficulty and made himself known to you? Can I see a raise of hands? 
Look around the room. This is the testimony of the church. God meets people in their brokenness. We've experienced that. We've seen that. And for some, you're going to look around and you're going to be like, that's encouraging, right? God moves. God meets you in the brokenness. For others, like the psalmist, it wasn't encouraging. He looks around and he's like, great. So God met all these people, not me. Right? What does that mean about me? And look what he says. But I'm a worm. I'm not even a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me, they mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads at me. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let him deliver him, they say. Let him rescue him, for he delights in God. And it's, it's mocking. And he's like, great. So God meets them, not me. What does that say about me? And then, and then the condemnation starts, Right? then it's like, am I ever going to get out of this? Am I even saved? Does does God even love me? Like, will this ever end? And it starts to get all-consuming, and it can almost build up into this panic inside. And then it ends in this cry of help. That it kind of started with, yes, God was faithful to them, but then he starts to recount how God has been faithful to him. Yet, yet, you're he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Do you see, like, he begins to remember, like, God's been faithful. I've seen it in the past from birth. He's been faithful faithful, but right now, I don't feel it. Right now, the only thing I can cry for is help. There's no one else, so help. My circumstances feel overwhelming. Help. And then the psalmist begins to lay out how he perceives those those, um, circumstances, almost like a snowball, just layered upon layer, the weight increasing until he feels completely crushed beneath it. When he says, many bulls encompass me, in verse 12, strong bulls from Bashan and around me, they open their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my mouth sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death for dogs encompass me. My company of evildoers encompass me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. You see this, he's just explaining through figurative language how how his circumstances feel like they're just all consuming, right? In in, in the bulls, the lion, the dog. And what you begin to see, and I want you to almost picture like an onion, right? Where, Where the psalmist is in the center and you have these layers of circumstances that feel suffocating, makes him feel like he can't see, like he can't escape it, where all he can do is cry out. And you have a layer that that he's calling the bull, a layer that he's calling the lions, and a layer that he's calling the dogs. And then what you begin to see here is that God meets him there and starts to rewrite his story, layer by layer, reversing the order to minister to the psalmist, to meet him where he's at, in his brokenness. And look at what it says in in 19 through 21. But you, you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. And you see that, that God is he's rewriting that story. He's meeting him where he's at. He's speaking through each and every one of those circumstances to reveal himself to the psalmist. 
And that can be encouraging. If you're going through a season of mourning, if your circumstances feel like a snowball that's just crushing you, but at a certain point, you're like, okay, prove it, right? Like, give me something I can hang on to. Like, okay, God's met other people that way, but how do I know? How do I know that this is a promise I can trust in? How do I know that this is a promise for me today? And that's where it begins to transition. And we see that, yes, this psalm was written in 1000 BC in the life of King David, who penned these words. They were real in the moment, but they were also spoken by Jesus as he hung on the cross. I mean, imagine this. In the final breath that Jesus had, right before he died, his final words were, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he cried out and died. This is what we see in, in, in Matthew 27. I did not do any of these slides. Where Jesus quotes these words, and, and what I want us to see is that it's possible to dig in and say, okay, well, why did Jesus quote these? Why were these the words that he said? And and what I want us to see is that uh, in the time that I lived in Israel, one of the things that that I learned is that there were four main teaching styles of rabbis at the time of Jesus. Okay, and one of those is called a remez. Now, a remez, when a rabbi wanted to teach something, he would say part of one thing, and then know that you understood the whole and infer the whole meaning. Okay, so for example, let's say that we're talking about insurance. And you're like, oh, what what insurance should we talk about? And I'm like, like a good neighbor. State Farm's there. Now, I've never said State Farm, but I got you to think what I wanted you to think, right? Or if we're going to go shopping, Christmas is coming up, and you're talking, you're like, hey, where should we go to get something? And you're like, I don't want to grow up. I'm a... Toys are us kid. Like, it comes to mind, right? This is what Jesus is doing. This was a song that had been around for a thousand years that would be sung in synagogues. Jesus, in his final breath, spoke the first words of this psalm to call to mind the whole passage. And I think we see evidence of that because of, in Matthew 27, we see that Jesus quoted these words, but you also see Matthew start to lay out these other areas as well, that this psalm is speaking of the gospel. It's speaking of these final moments of Jesus. And I want you to imagine, you've just watched all of this happen. For three hours, darkness covered. Jesus has been hanging on the cross. You're bewildered. You're confused. Life is not going how you expect it. You did not expect your rabbi, the Messiah, to have to die on the cross. This was not part of the plan. This is not how things were supposed to go. You're standing there in absolute confusion. Jesus says these words, and then this psalm comes to mind. And then all of a sudden, you you kind of begin to rewind and say, wait, what did I just see? What just happened? Because in in Matthew 27, 35, uh, and then in Psalm 22, 16, it talks, if you heard, about hands and feet being pierced. This was 500 years before the first uh, historical account that can be found referring to crucifixion in any way. So much so that people wanted to try to doubt that this was written when it was written. Let's try to make excuses because it doesn't make any sense. Oh, yes, it's inspired by God. It's prophetic. God knew. David may not have even understood the full meaning of the words that he was saying. They were just emotions in his heart, but they became a reality in the life and death of Christ. That, that you see in, in Matthew 27, 35 about dividing the garments and casting lots. Like all of a sudden, you see this picture that had unfolded before you, and you're like, wait a minute. This song that I'm familiar with, this song that we would sing, was speaking of this very moment. In reality, like the despair at the moment for the disciples, it would have been pointing to Christ is the ultimate fulfillment here. 
You see this later on as well in Matthew 27, 39 about wagging their heads or even the mocking challenge to trust in God. Right after Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Their response is, oh, is he calling out to Elijah? Is he expecting God to save him? Let God save him then. And then he dies. They're mocking him in his final moments. And, and, and David's pain was real. But Christ's suffering was ultimate. It was final. It was complete. And so do you feel forsaken this morning? Do you feel like, like God's distant, like he doesn't hear? Because we see in the beauty of the gospel that, yes, Jesus hears. And one of the central verses in this psalm of kind of where the whole narrative hinges is on verse 24. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him. But he has heard. He has heard your cries. But more than that, not only has he heard, he has already acted. He has already done something about the brokenness that we experience. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross in our place. That this world is broken because of sin. From the beginning of creation, God created the world perfect. We lived in, in perfect relationship with creation, with God, and with each other. Right? There was none of this mourning or brokenness. It was sin that brought them in. That we could see God face to face, but in that original sin, we turned our backs to God. And we said, I want to go this way. And in freedom, all we can say is, I want to go any direction, as long as it's not toward God. And he would have been fully right to say, go. Suffer the consequences of your own actions. I created it perfect. You've messed it up. Deal with it. But he pursued us. God, rich in his mercy, pursued us while we were still sinners. He sought after us. He turned us back to himself because of his death on the cross so that by faith we can be restored, we can be redeemed. And yes, we still suffer. Yes, we still grieve because sin still exists in the world. But God is present. Even when he feels silent, even when he feels different, we can know that he is close because he has already proved it on the cross. Because he has already acted. He has already pursue, pursued us. That there is hope in that. There's knowledge in that. That even in the silence, he has drawn near. And that this should lead us to sing. This should, should lead us to have a hope. It doesn't mean the sadness always goes away. It doesn't always mean the mourning ends right away. There are seasons. But there can be a foundation beneath our feet of hope. That our pain is not final. The darkness is not permanent. There is light in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then it leads us to sing. Look at what it says then in verse 22. When it says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in all of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he has cried to him, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of all the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Do you see this song that wells up, that it's from God, not from within, not, not because of our circumstances, not like, oh, just be happy, don't be sad. From God 
wells up a song of praise that he is faithful. And that song starts with the brothers. It starts with family. It starts with the congregations. It goes out to the ends of the earth, to peoples among all nations, even beyond that, to future generations, to children who have yet to be born, will hear the testimony of the saints and look to Jesus. Like that should build within us a hope. I loved it in the ESV study Bible. Out of all the commentaries, it was the ESV study Bible, which is an amazing resource. It said this, the psalmist's personal story of trouble and vindication is part of the larger story of God's redemptive work in the world. Now think about that for a moment, right? Your personal story, all those who raise their hands, do you remember that? Like you've experienced something of brokenness and God met you in that. That is part of a larger story. That's not just your story. That's part of God's story. That's being written across all creation. The redemption of His work. That your story is connected to His story. And so in closing this morning, I have two applications. The first is if you're here this morning and you're going through one of these difficult times. You resonate with the psalmist. Like, I'm crying out. I don't feel heard. I feel alone in my suffering. Can I encourage you to look to the pattern that we see established here in Psalm 22? See how God has been faithful to others. I remember there was a, a couple when I was pastoring up in Maryland the wife, they were an older couple, and she had found out that the husband had been having a long-term affair with a co-worker at work. And she was like, I'm done. All of her friends were like, I'm done. I, I can't. I can't do this. We're going to have to get a divorce. The husband was, was repentant, and we believe the gospel redeems, even in the worst of situations. And so what we're trying to encourage, and we're like, God can redeem this. I know it's hard. I can't even imagine. But I believe that the gospel can redeem even this situation. And she's like, maybe, but not me. I, I just prove it is what she ended up saying to us. Like, show me somebody else who has gone through this situation, and now their marriage is happy. Prove it. Like, just show me another story so I have evidence. And there was another couple in our church who went through, it wasn't out there, it wasn't public, and we were able to connect these couples, and they're together today. They're still friends of ours. And we saw God redeem, but when she was in her darkest hour, she needed the testimony of someone else. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're like, I'm here I, I, I want to believe you, Pastor, but can you connect me with somebody else who's going through this as well? I just need to know I'm not alone. Look to the testimony of someone else for strength. Examine how God's been faithful to you personally. Historically, like in the past, maybe you're not feeling it now, but are, are there seasons in life where we're like, I saw God work here. Yes, he, he was faithful here and he was faithful here. So help me trust you now moving forward in the future. The second area I want to encourage you is to tell your story. That if you're here, and maybe, maybe you are going through a difficult season, maybe you're not. To tell your story, because it's not just about your story, that this is part of God's redemptive work in the world to all peoples, all nations, to future generations. Where are you telling your story? For all those that raised your hands, aren't you in the least bit curious? Right? God's been moving in a lot of different ways. Do, do we have any idea? Can we celebrate this together? Did you know that storytelling is the most effective way of human communication? Jesus used it 35% of the time in all of his teachings. Science has even proved it that, that it activates different parts of your brain as though the hearer is experiencing those events with you, causing them to remember and apply a story more than just information. Tell your story 
And I want to make this practically easy for you. How? On xpoint.info, we created a card that's called Crosspoint Stories. And it really goes through three questions to help you tell your story. The first is saying this, that, that you thought you knew your story's happy ending. Describe what you were seeking and why. Every good story has that goal at the beginning, right? I thought life would be grand. I thought my marriage would be different than all the others. I thought I wouldn't go through any difficulties. I was expecting a healthy life. I was expecting this job to, to fulfill all my dreams. But then something happened that broke this, that trials and troubles come, that shake the blinders off, and we see where we're really going. So then to help you describe those circumstances, the, the, those struggles that you pass through, and then the final question is looking at the redemption of our suffering is knowing Jesus on the other side. So describe how you've experienced God and how he has connected your story with the gospel. It's those three simple questions. You can type it up, and we ask you if we have permission to share it or not. Okay, so you're in full control. I, I want us to be a, a congregation that can celebrate in where God is at work. All these hands that were raised, what if we knew each other's stories? What if we could celebrate how he's active? What if, you, what if you're struggling with major depression and you're like, I feel alone and consumed and unloved by God. Is there somebody I can talk to? Am I the only one? Like, it's in each other's stories and testimony that, that it's God's story within us. So I want to encourage you, share your story. Let it be a testimony to God's faithfulness. Let's share these with one another. If I get responses, we'll find ways to get those stories out, to let you know so that we can read and celebrate where God's working together as we pursue him and seek him. So let's stand as we prepare to take communion. That as we prepare to, to come, come forward to take communion, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I, I want to encourage you to, to share with us in this act of worship as we remember that Christ's body was broken so that we could be healed. He died on the cross for our sins so that we could be saved. That our mourning can be turned to joy because of Christ. That our hope has deep roots because of his work. And so as we dip the cup, dip the bread in the cup, we remember Christ's body that was broken when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. That our pain is real, but his suffering was ultimate. It was final. He said it is finished. There is no more. There is light at the end of the tunnel. So as we take communion, may it lead us to rejoice, to sing about his great mercy. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that your word speaks to the depths of our hearts. Lord, that, that in our pain, in our brokenness, Lord, that you meet us in our despair, that, that you're not, you don't despise our feelings, Lord, but that you are compassionate, that you hear us when we cry, Lord, and that you acted, that you acted upon our brokenness, that you pursued us while we were still sinners, Lord, that you have turned us toward yourself. And Lord, may your song of your glory well up inside of us, and may we procla proclaim your name, to our family, to our congregation, to the nations, Lord, so that all generations might sing and praise the name of Jesus. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.